Hello, my name is David Bryan, and this is Curiosity Invited, a podcast inspired by endless curiosity. Tune in for an open-minded conversation about interesting and important things. Okay. Welcome, everybody. This is Curiosity Invited, and uh, my name is David Bryan, and I have the great pleasure today of speaking with a gentleman I, I've met only once before, David Bolton. And uh, I'm going to do that thing that I don't particularly love to do. And actually, I, I don't love to do it usually because it's boring and also because it involves reading, which we'll talk about in a little while. Um, but there's a brief bio that I'm going to uh, read from. And then, and then perhaps if you're willing, David, then we will maybe we can flesh some of that out and uh, and get a different sort of bio as well. So, um, okay. so sure. David, David Bolton is president of Learning Stewards and director of the Children of the Code Project. David Bolton is a learning activist, a, a term I have never heard before, a learning activist, technologist, public speaker, documentary producer, and author. He's designed Apple computers, Electronic Campus, back in the day. He's been an advisor to the chair of the California Senate Education Committee, a member of the United States Department of Education's Gateway Project, and a featured blogger for the National Association of School Superintendents. He appeared in the PBS television show, The New Science of Learning, Brain Fitness for Kids, and in the Science Network's The New Science of Educating broadcast. Uh, David's current project, the Online Learning Support Network, or Olson, you'll hear more about that, I hope, um, is a revolutionary new technology and pedagogy that is redefining how the internet supports learners worldwide. Worldwide. So, David, thank you, thank you so much for uh, for agreeing to have this conversation, and I, I hope we go to all sorts of places that neither of us imagined at the moment. <laughs> Wonderful. That'd be great. That'd be great. Good. So, yeah. um, so, so I just read that, you know, that the stuff, but, but how, how did that come to be? Like, were you always, were you one of those people who like knew from age five, I want to be a teacher when I grow up, or I want to be involved in education or I like, where did that come from? Uh, absolutely not. Uh, I, I totally uh, disliked everything about education as a student. To I mean, just totally, um, which is a story unto itself. I, I was about uh, 30 years old. I'd already formed a company when I was 26 years old. We made the robotic machines that made the initial plated disks that made personal computers possible. And so I was 30 years old winning the, to the game, the guy who dies with the most toys wins, kind of oh, in yes. that whole thing, Silicon Valley in its early heyday. Uh, my previous experience had been a yield analysis engineer for Signetics, which was one of the first chip makers before such thing as microprocessors. What is it? What is a yield, at, What is a yield analysis technology? Oh, what does that mean? Um, in that day, uh, well, uh, semiconductors are grown on disks. Right. And um, it's a very complicated process of depositing things and chemicals and uh, photoresist and exposure and to grow this many, many layers and process those layers into something that acts as a functional device, a semiconductor. Uh, anyway, um, as a young man, um, one of my jobs was working in one of those companies when it was in the early days, the biggest RAM chip on the planet was 256 bits. Oh, wow. Okay. I mean, yeah. that's how big, right? Uh, those, and and I'm looking in back in the day, and I'm looking through microscopes and trying to find out what's going wrong with the fabrication of these things. So, wow. so that was yeah. one of my backgrounds. Yeah. The other background I had concurrent to that was in relay logic for building security systems for the Atomic Energy Commission for a company also in Silicon Valley. So I was doing these two jobs. Anyway, I formed my is own that, company. Is that, is that because your training was like, did you go to school for engineering? No, nope. no, no. I, I took some uh, quantum physics related to semiconductor uh, analysis while I was in college. But no, I never finished college and I never went on any of those tracks formally. That's I just learned my, learned my way in. Yeah. 
anyway, through a long process, divorce, following wife, kids, all that kind of stuff, I ended up uh, forming a company of my own that welded my semiconductor and computer experience with my chemical processing and really logic experience to make these robotic machines that were half a million to a million dollars a pop back in 1980 that made the plated disks that were used in computers as well as circuit boards and other kinds of stuff. Yeah, yeah. And so by the time I was 30, I have a hundred people working for me, a big factory could build anything you can imagine with your mind. Uh, I have a small computer company on the side that's building the guts of the minds of these robots that are doing all this work. And um, I went on, the only way I could describe it is a kind of a strange learning binge um, where I started to use the computers to journal myself. Mm -hmm. And the consequence of that process uh, and my growing appetite for learning and a few other things that went, oops, get rid of that, um, led me to, uh, to, to this kind of uh, transformation of sorts where uh, I came to realize that I could learn anything because I was very frustrated with the materials I was learning from, library stuff, documentaries, audio books, books. There was always this kind of presumption of proximity of learner and, and writer, right? There's this very narrow gap of yes. readiness you had to be in order to be able to get at that stuff. Yes. And it really bothered me because I realized I could learn anything if who or what I was learning from could meet me on the edge of what I needed to stay in it. Yes, and it, it, that hit me like a atom bomb. That it, and one other thing that happened in that time frame that was really important to me was all my grow my life I'd kind of grown up thinking somebody out there knows, right? There's this kind of it is soness tone that permeates the way books and the authoritarian professorial it is so tone that radiates through everything. And yet, the closer I got in my inquiries to anything that was vital, whether it was quantum physics or various dimensions of philosophy or, or interpretations of mythology or geology or just, well, you name it, anything that was a vital science or inquiry dimension that touched on what is really important, right? There's a raging argument going on there. Yes, right. Right. So and, somehow, and that's, and that's where the interesting <laughs> stuff really happens, right? That's right where the interesting the stuff. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And so what that did was shatter the illusion that it was about knowledge. And that coupled with the other point that I just made said, it's all about learning. It's not about the knowledge is like I would say today, knowledge, the, the power of knowledge is its resourcefulness to learning. It's always yeah. temporally, it's always got a, a narrow right. temporal window of actual validity and value other than that, right? right? right. So right. those two things, to add, long way around back to the start of your question, oh, I get it. That's, that's where the learning commitment came in, which was, you know, uh, when I was 30 years old. And what did that make you do? That learning commitment, like what, like, so you had this aha. And so how do you get from running these companies to, to what you then embarked on, on you're, you know, you're a learning activist, <laughs> whatever that means, right? What does that yeah. mean? By the way? Well, I, 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 I did invent that term. It doesn't yeah. exist anywhere out there except me. It's and it, 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 mean, it means everything you could imagine by the juxtaposition of those two words, whether it's in terms of supporting an individual and activating their learning or being an activist about reframing how we think about learning at a general public level. So it, it means both of those, all those things you can imagine together in one. So, so how, how'd you get to that? What, how'd you take the, what did the, what did the step from, from um, I'm running these companies to, to I'm really interested in how people learn and at least, at least from what I've read, you gravitate. You didn't just you didn't gravitate to any place. You gravitated to the education world, or at least people who were thinking about the world called education. So how'd you get there? Well, yes and no. I mean, I, 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 a big part of this is just as I was coming out of this, you know, year-long learning binge that I just described that resulted in that shattering of knowledge and that sense that anybody could learn anything. Not just me. I wasn't thinking that was me. I, I was thinking I was everybody. 
that frustration and tension in me with the way things are is something everybody's experiencing and that anybody could learn anything if they were met in the right way. So those things collided me. And just at that time, a baby boy's born. My, my son, right? Yeah. My second son. Yeah. And he is this exhibit, this living spiritual being that's also incredibly innocent and intelligent and exhibiting the all that's great about human beingness and how human beingness learns without any preconceptions right there with me, right? And so our journey together revealed um, so much to me. So, uh, and it was while I was working on how to describe um, what we were talking about before, the knowledge, the learning, um, and one of the tactics I took with him when he was an infant was that I never read to him baby books. I never read to him little books. I read to him what I was reading for myself and just modulated it emotionally in a way that he could kind of track with, right? Um, that had lots of neurocognitive linguistic benefits to him, which showed up later. But for me, it meant that he wasn't he wasn't somehow separated from my work. He, him and I were in this together, kind of merged into this flow of learning together, me out over here, you know, extending in one dimension and him on another. Um, so while in the course of doing this and while in the course of writing what would be a kind of a multi-level uh, publication that would work differently in the electronic world, what I would later call electronic publishing for learning, a way of creating a, a relationship with information that has an a, a elastic responsivity to the articulation or expression of learning or meaning needs that would deal with the problem that we were talking about before, right? So I was work designing that, working on that in one part of my life. And then on the other part, I was really troubled by having to disturb him to turn pages. <laughs> so I developed an electronic book, right? Really? I developed, yeah, it was, this is 1984, 85, right? Kind of thing. So I developed a, what was a d digital display touch thing that I could just, you know, anyway, I designed all that and I designed how to use, uh, improve analog uh, decoding technology to increase the information density in analog data streams, right? And a few other things. And I, I, I got the attention of uh, some investors and some other people and my life started to change from the work that I was doing before to starting to build technologies that could support the kind of learning I was on about. That and brought you were, me to- and you, were, you were convinced at that moment early on that the solution for lack of a better word that the solution to the to the challenge that we were just speaking about before of 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 not being able to m meet or be met in that moment was going to be a technological one I, I, I mean, no. I, here's why i'm asking that question because you're, good, good, because, good. you're because you're you as you spoke about reading to your son Right. You know, you're reading things that are, quote, above his head, right? He, he, he'd never bump into any of those things. And yet you were able to read to him in a way where there was, that was about, I mean, you made that motion, right? Like you, it was somehow tempo and. Yeah, he was and, mesmerized. He was tracking with me energetically yeah. through this. Yes. Yeah. So, so, so what convinced you? that the solution was going to be in technology. I'm not, this is not challenging. I'm really- No, 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 that's, that's a beautiful question. And there's an important part to it. It's not that the, the important part of learning is about information and technology. It's not. I just thought that it was the least defended place to make a change. And that's yeah. a more complicated question to get into. But yeah. our relationship with, our relationship with information is, fundamentally learning disabling the way that it is mm. in that it requires this conformity this readiness this pre-preparation whether we're talking about decoding skills or vocabulary or background knowledge or all kinds of layers that it takes to be ready to learn from something that's static right yes. but by making that more elastic and responsive to what somebody needs 
then that whole thing becomes a different kind of portal that can demonstrate the value of stewarding learning in a more efficient way, in a better way, right? So it wasn't that that um, yeah. that I think that the fundamental problem. I, I, I'm uh, at the same time I'm doing this, working on these technologies, and which brings me to the attention of Apple Computer, which is where another dimension takes off. I'm also very interested and drawn to the work of David Bohm, right? Sure. I, I I was scheduled to meet Chris Demerty just before he died, right? But uh, not being able to meet him, I did meet David Bohm. And later I actually arranged to bring him to Apple Computer to speak at Apple, right? Before I, uh, and worked with Senge and others to try to make that happen. Yeah. But my work with Bohm, what Bohm hit me like a lightning bolt with was think implicately. Right. I mean, do you familiar with Bohm's yes. work in implicate yes. order and all that kind of stuff? Yes. And so the idea of an, of the implicate order applied to learning really blew me open to another level. Right. Say, say so, more about that. Can, can you? Well, <clears throat> one of the things that I was really interested in was in my observations of children, and I spent a lot of time both watching my son, but also his his friends and cousins, I had 17 cousins, you know, he'd hang out with uh, nieces and nephews of mine that because of my parents' uh, prolificness, uh, yeah. you know, did that you get, kind of thing, you, right? Did you get all their names straight? No, 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 oh, okay. I couldn't, I couldn't <laughs> tell you who they are that anymore. Makes me but, feel yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, anyway, um, I, I became really fascinated with a, a number of questions about how children were processing the world. For example, um, it was really clear to me that they're making discernments about preferences and objects and making decisions and what have you before they have language to mediate the process, right? Which yes. means that they're making they're making nonverbal discernments yes. or ver dis discernments that are not based on verbal distinctions anyway, right? Yeah. All right. So it, there's a relationship between this nonverbal realm, right? and the verbal realm. And my sense was, is that the efficiency of learning is dependent on how they co-implicate, right? So that's the, the point with, with Bohm was that their, their relationship is not some kind of linear ordered thing. It's a, it's a mutual co-implication that the nonverbal and the verbal, when they co-implicate, they have a, a depth of integration that allows for a transfer Yes. That's not possible if it's associational and linear. Right. Right. I get it. Yes. Okay. Understood. Yeah. yeah. Understood. Okay. So wait, no, now get back to it. So, so, and Apple, I asked the question about what convinced you that it was, that it was right. technological. And you said, well, it was the other thing you were watching your cousin, your son's cousins, et cetera, et cetera, were do you remember where we were going? I'm sorry I asked that yeah. question. No, 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 I'll be sorry. Um, I mean, unless you need to, not for me anyway. Um, <laughs> no, I'm okay. <laughs> good, good. Yeah, uh, again, because I was so uh, uh, stuttered and uh, obstructed by the static uh, pres presuppositions about information mediated learning. It, it was certainly a part of what was going on for me. But I also realized the more that I started to interact with educators, people at Apple, that th the paradigm inertia in education is stunning. I mean, it's you might as well be talking about arguing uh, Christ, you know, Christians out of whether a cross exists, you know? I mean, th th there's a there's a real attachment to particular yeah. ways of looking at all of this. Yeah. And, and all of that retards our, uh, dissipates our, re reduces our capacity to make the kind of changes as it re relates yeah. to learning that we got to make. And, and that information was an area that exhibited all of our problems, particularly reading, and that's where we're getting to, right? Yes. right. But, but, but it was the least defended, at least so I thought at the time. Yeah. Yeah, you know, you, you just, you reminded me of, um, oh gosh, am I going to remember it? Um, as you were speaking, oh, Buckminster Fuller, who, who sort of in frustration talked about how it takes 
a minimum of 75 years for a new idea, a new discovery to make its way into the curriculum. And so imagine 75 years later, I mean, you might as well, like, what's the, what's the point? Right. Yeah. Well, by then, because by then it's so far past that. What do you wait another 75 years? But yes, it is such a, it is such a constrained territory. Yeah. That, yeah. That, the world yeah. of education and the assumptions about education. And yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. Which is the core of where I've, I'm, where I've come to really is, is that, you know, what are those assumptions and, and what can um, challenge them out in a way that they can actually change rather than just um, inspire greater resistance to change. <laughs> well, there's a goal. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, well I mean, well, uh, to me, there's nothing more important. Yes. Well, in so many ways. Right. Yeah. 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 Um, Okay, so so, but but you somehow managed to get the ears of, or at least an ear of people who were in the, who were working in the world of education. So how that how did that happen? I mean, I I I, I did a talk in Cupertino, and uh, the one of the administrators uh, at Cupertino Union School District, which was Apple's playground and prototyping space at the time, uh, really took a shine to what I was saying about, at this point, the design of the learner interface. And basically my point of the technological design, not to digress too much, but to try to nail this thing quickly, was that we're focused on what they should learn or how they should learn it. And I've been concerned with how do we create an environment that's sufficiently granularly responsive to their articulations and expressions of learning and meaning needs, that it creates an opportunity for them to get better at expressing their uh, meaning needs and learning needs as the central driving, uh, as a central driver in their participation, mm-hmm. right? And, and that comes from, if you watch a child um, when they're doing anything that, and this is a big distinction between natural and artificial modes of learning that the information relationship cuts right in the middle of. If you watch children as they're learning in natural organic ways, they're they're using a uh, compass to navigate with that's basically the disambiguation, the differentiation and disambiguation of their own proprioceptive flow. Right. Right. Yes. So right. feeling themselves start to walk, paying attention to the feedback they're getting it, just in the emotional dance with another, uh, manipulating a, an object and uh, the tactile feedback there. It's all right on the live edge of right now. Right. And they're getting this feedback in direct correspondence to what they're doing on that edge as they extend into becoming more present and more facile in different domains of existence. That's the core of human learning, right? The artificial learning requires us to completely subordinate that and make learning right or wrong in relation to an external, uh, conventional, technological set of uh, goals, assumptions, right, wrongs, uh, correctness, et cetera, et cetera, right? So it it takes them out of having that compass and out into this consensual technological uh, system. And that's where the breakdown is, I think. The majority of kids that really have most trouble is they smash into that like a wall because their, their, their organizational evolutionary instantiation with respect to learning has no truck with that. It doesn't know what to do with that. Right. And, we don't, and because we don't pay attention to that difference, we don't build a ladder or a bridge between those two. No, no, right? and, 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 and to make it worse, speaking as a guy who was in the world of education for that, for, as, a, as one of those people, uh, uh, to make it worse, because you know, because the human population is is large and diverse, there are some people who bump into that to that artificial edge and do it successfully, and yeah. so they become the well. That's that's the proof that we're doing it right. 
Yep. And everybody who struggles with that, well, somehow they're missing something. Now we're missing yep. something, or we just happen to be, you know, looking at that thin slice of the world that unfortunately is programmed that way, <laughs> happens to be that way. Yeah, and, yeah. And, and it, the best and example it of that. More and more entrenched. So, yep, yeah. yep. The best example of that to me was Obama, right? The difference between race to the top and no child left behind yes. is really, it's really that, right? In that yeah. um, people that come through this and are successful, it's very hard for them to be able to, and they can have a model, they can have an idea, they can have a mental right. image about what it must be like to not do it, but they don't have a first person experience of what that's like. Right. And one of the things that really bothers me when you look at this, and I don't know if you've seen any of the charts that I put out about this, but we've been flatlined with respect to educational progress on virtually every significant measure for as long as we've been keeping data. More than two thirds of the kids are chronically underwater in everything we think is important. And it gets worse depending upon, you know, social economic status and race. And that, and that, and that is, that occurs at the policy level and the individual child level. So, you know, a kid, a kid doesn't get algebra, fails algebra. What do we do? We make that child repeat algebra and frequently yeah. the same teacher It's like, yeah. and doing the same coursework in the same. So it's like, okay, how stupid are we? I mean, really? yeah, exactly, exactly, like, well, exactly. How, it has to stay. I mean, we're staring it right in the face. And yeah, well, well, let's, you know, work harder <laughs> this time, yeah. work harder. Well, th th this is this to me, this is the core, right? Yeah. I mean, why do we why do we do that? Because we have a fundamental misperception of the role of learning, how learning works and the role of learning in human life. Mm -hmm. We tend to think of it in very, very narrow ways. And the ways we think about learning disable our learning. And yes. you know, I hope that we'll get to that as we progress. That's oh, the yeah. real core of things for me. Please, I will but, I'll tell you, I, as I was reading through your stuff, the, I had never, th I never thought of it that way, but um, I'm gonna misquote, so you can correct it. But, but uh, you were speaking about, you were speaking about, you were writing about, um, uh, someone trying to learn and they come upon a word they don't know. And at that moment, they, you know, at that moment, they're alone. Yeah. I think they are now suddenly alone. They don't have all, the only feedback they have is no, right? No, that's not it. Try it again. No, that's not it. And there, there they are. There they are all by themselves. And, you know, either they get lucky or they don't, or they happen to get a clue from somebody else, or they scramble through all the, all the uh, uh, protocols that they, if they can remember them, oh, wait, that's an A and it sounds like ah, so maybe that's ah, and like, you know, it's like, but they're out there by themselves, which I thought, I mean, it really hit me like a, it hit me. Yeah. Like I just got hit in the chest partially because of my own struggle learning to read and learning, especially learning to read out loud, which was sort of, you know, and on top of, and on top of this challenge, I now have the public performance to read aloud and have yeah. an audience know that I, I am floundering out there by myself. And it was just like, wow, that is so true. And, and, and the other thing I just want to say, and, you know, maybe I'm speaking too much, but, but as you were speaking, know. as you were speaking, I, I remember this was before I got into education, whatever that means. Um, I was in it because I was a student, but, but uh, I remember sitting in Washington Square Park in New York City, you know, and, and watching skateboarders and trying to learn a trick over and over and over there was you know there was so much conversation about you know kids don't do homework or they're lazy or they're you know, like whatever he just does johnny doesn't work that all, work hard enough and it's like and here nobody's nobody's forcing anybody to do anything this kid these kids want to learn this trick because they and they they fall and then they get up and they, and they, it's exactly that thing they've they are there's no language necessarily involved in this. Nobody's saying, 
Like, you know, nobody's saying like the coaches say to a baseball player, you're dropping your shoulder, maybe, but, but they're, they are adjusting based on that experience they just had without language, right? But with something else. And it, it's, it's such a, it's such an obvious, well, it ought to be such an obviously instructive moment for people yeah. or, or just that you know just the way in which kids in in our culture and in every other culture in the world how do what do kids do they 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 act like their parents they they mimic they own this play house i'm going to be the mom you're going to be the dad whatever the hell they do you know this is how you hunt this is how you, and then whoosh, we send them to school and all of a sudden there's a resistance to learning what's that about well it's that it's all that stuff they just hit this yeah. wacky thing and 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 there's no there's no help there's no help let, telling them where to go with it so anyway yeah i mean the point about the skateboarding in particular is interesting in that the skateboard is, is artificial right it's not something that occurs in nature right. but learning it is natural it's completely Right. Yeah. And that's the difference between the, the artificial and natural that's generally lost on people, but so important. When you get to reading, you're talking about something that's it's not just that it's artificial, it's bizarrely artificially confusing. Yes. Right? Certainly. In a way that we wouldn't let we wouldn't let any machine in the world run a code that is as bizarrely messed up and confused as the code that will determine the fate of our children's lives if they don't get it right by the time they're seven. Right. Right. It's right. just bizarre. Yes. Um, whew, yeah. And, and you know, uh, I would jump, uh, you know, some years forward from where we left the story just to get into the reading conversation and kind of make this more real. It also brings in our mutual friend, Gary David, uh, who I met shortly after this time at Apple, right? Ah. So, so <clears throat> um, my son, when I told you I was reading to when he was a baby, when he gets to school, right? I'm, I'm working at Apple. I'm working on this electronic book stuff, but I'm not paying attention to reading at all. I'm, I'm assuming reading. I'm assuming just like I could read, I was yeah. assuming these other dimensions of how to, how to take, uh, how to correlate multitude of representations. So that somebody can like to imagine a learning through information, like learning through a microscope that has rings. You can spin through the rings to find the representation that makes it come home for you. Right. Uh, that kind of stuff. Right. So, so a, a different mental scope for relating to information it's working on that. So one day my five-year-old son who I never explicitly taught to read comes home from kindergarten with a book in his hand and he points to me at a word and he says, dad, it can't be like that. And I said, what are you talking about? And here's a kid at five years old, his kindergarten teacher says, this boy's got the vocabulary of a 20 year old. <laughs> right? So he was verbally dexterous. He's really bright. He learned all kinds of stuff on his own when with he was just part of we were together in this kind of learning journey in our dialogues and whiteboard. He had a whiteboard space in my office, <laughs> whatever. Right. But anyway, he comes home with this book and he points to it and he says, it can't be like that. And for the first time in my adult life, I experience the confusion, a bright, literate, a bright, excuse me, a verbally dexterous, bright young mind is having as they encounter this code. What was the word? <laughs> I forget the word. I wish I could remember. <laughs> but wow, it blew me away. If this and becomes so that, a movie, if it becomes a movie, you need to remember the word. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I get it. Yeah. Anyway, I I, um, I wrote I, at the time at the time I wrote a paper. I said, you know what? In the days of uh, old when we had no choice but to print things in a way that the characters once printed were dead um, or uh, because of the cost efficiency, we couldn't make 25 variations of a letter A, you know, um, that the printer could change in and out. But with desktop publishing, we got a whole lot of new dexterities 
that we could, uh, my original idea was, we could change the dimensional presence of a letter without changing its character recognition features in, in stepped ways so that it tells you which of its possible sounds it's actually making in any word you're looking at, right? So we could make the letters visual appearance variations cue you to their sounds as you were reading to knock out the letter sound confusion, which is at the core of stuttering up reading minds, right? So I wrote a paper about that and I shared it with about a thousand educators in the time. They all thought I was from fucking Mars. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I kind of gave up on it after, you know, I mean, I thought it was important, but, uh, but after putting it out there and I was busy with other stuff and I helped my son get through the reading thing by understanding where his confusions were and just being able to listen to him read. And when he started to stumble or stutter, be able to interject and cue him with my voice as to which of those letters he was stuttering on and off he would go. So he took off. Two weeks later, he was reading like a like a rocket, no concern. And I forgot about reading for a while. Mm. Wow. Wow. How old was he? Five. He was, he was five. Yeah. 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 Amazing. And then and then it came back because because what you yeah. were speaking about was the beginnings. Of, I'm assuming the beginnings of what isn't. Olson, yeah? No, no, that's much later, no. Oh. Um, so uh, anyway, I was working on, uh, I'm gonna skip over a big part, 10 years later now, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, um, I'm, uh, I'm, I've got a daughter and she's now five years old. She had some speech issues when she was younger. And um, she hits school and me and her mother in the, are in this kind of differencing. This is where I meet Gary because she originally came in through her. And um, I recognize my daughter's problem. She goes to a preschool that teaches her in a different way than kindergarten does and first grade does. But the time she gets to kindergarten and first grade, she's having all the problems my son had with the bizarre confusion, but she's got an auditory memory processing deficit, which means that even if she works out the word in sentence one, she appear, she experiences it again in sentence two, she's got to start all over again. She can't remember that she did it. Right. And I just watch her start to die. Shame out. I've got, you know, video of her at that time. It's just, just, mm. I can't tell, can't tell you. And, and that changed my life. And just to show you how the universe works, there's an interesting little side story that she kicks this in Children of the Code off. She's right, right when we're starting to recognize that she's got a problem and I'm starting to come out of my other universe and focus again on reading. We're at a garage sale and um, I'm off in one corner. She's in another corner. She comes up to me with this book she hands it to me. She says, well, how about we read this together, Daddy? And it's King Arthur and His Noble Knights by John Steinbeck. John Steinbeck, I said. Wow. And I opened the first part of the book up, and it says, some people there are who, being grown, forget the horrible task of learning to read. It is the hardest thing a human being ever does, and they have to do it as a child. That's its wow. first paragraph. Wow. Goes on, he goes on to describe how, despite becoming a uh, Nobel Prize, you know, for, for author, right, for literature, how he grew up just terrified. He thought letters were the most cruel human inventions ever in history until he accidentally stumbled across a manuscript of Mort d'Arthur from the 15th century, original King Arthur in Old English, which for some reason made sense to his mind. And because the code cohered, he took off. <laughs> That's great. That's, yeah. I mean, it's, it sort of chokes me up. That, that, yeah. kind of, and again, because it's my, I'm, I'm, I'm seeing your daughter and I'm seeing myself. That struggle, which was just, yeah. Fortunately, at this point in time, um, Gary Kim comes into my life a lot more. 
and I'm, I'm my uh, work work on learning up to this point it has been all these dimensions we've talked about, and um, and I've been very concerned about emotions, but I've never really given it the kind of granularized thought that Gary would bring in as we started to talk about shame and shame's role, and as I started to witness this happening in my daughter, right. So now um, I'm I'm more concerned with how this artificial confusion is causing her and millions of kids like her who are struggling. They may not have the auditory memory processing deficit as right. some kind of a basis. They may be unready for any number of other reasons that sure. we could talk about in ad nauseum, right? As far as early life learning trajectories, preparing them for the challenge. But um, <clears throat> that what we're talking about is children losing faith in learning. And the children, and the, yeah, well, what what faith can they have in themselves if they don't have faith in their learning? Right, but if they, they, they don't see it as something visiting on, the, visiting them from the outside. There's something wrong with me. That's right. That's right. That's right. The most common thing, and if you go to uh, and when I started to do the research that would begin Children of the Code, the literature on this from the National Institute of Child Health and Human Development and other ones was the first casualty, the first consequence of protracted difficulty is self-blame, mm -hmm. right? It is, it is this self-blame triggered shame, right? So yeah, the kids, they don't have the meta reflectiveness to say, hey, this code's a mess. I shouldn't have to deal with this. <laughs> or why, why the hell didn't my, my mom talk to me more when I was in a crib? Right. You know, or what, what was with my preschool teacher? Didn't know what the hell she was doing, right. you know? Or they don't have any of that. All they know is, is that I should be doing this and I'm not doing this. There's something wrong with me. They can do it. They can do it. Whatever. They do it best of all, but I can't do it. Yeah. Yeah. Brutal. Yeah. yeah. And that, that's really the core for me uh, to this day is that um, in a way, when I talked to you before about how education is not so um, receptive. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the, the, the reading wars are reminiscent of the Crusades. Right of this of these re religious belief systems fighting with each other. Absolutely. Right. So yeah. so I I ended up interviewing a hundred or so scholars, and I sat across from the the person who is responsible for the greatest amount of uh, research in this field, who was the czar of American reading, right? Who reported to Congress for three decades and all the presidents at that time worked for those directly for the presidents right at the national institute of health right ran the national institute of child health and human development branch that focused all of the government money on reading research and i said so what we're talking about then is the majority of our children are having their lives all but faded by the difficulty they're encountering learning to relate to a technological artifact to an archaic artifact. And he said, oh, you mean lousy teaching? Ah. So the solution was to hire better teachers? To train them in the, in the ways that they were supposed to be trained. Right, and, that's, and the ways they were supposed to be trained was the war. That that was the read. Those were the reading wars. Yep. Good luck. I I, I had a conversation with uh, a guy by the name of Keith Stanovich, who was uh, the chair of cognitive science for the country of Canada, one of the premier uh, cognitive scientists in the world. After three or four hours of conversation with him, got to a similar spot, you know. And what he said is this. You know, that he really appreciated where I was framing all of this, but that once I got down to the correspondence between code confusion and reading difficulties, I had to be really careful because they didn't want to go there. They didn't want to go there because that's what caused whole language to get risen. 
And that's what causes the reading wars. And they're talking to, and all these people have been badly burned by decades of reading wars. And they just got the engine on the phonics train and they don't oh want it God. messed with. Wow. That last part is, is a compilation of all of the experts. Yeah. His point was, we've been badly burned. We don't want to go there, right? Yeah. This is from a world-class scientist. Wow. Right. And that was the case with most of them. I'd get right to that edge and that's where we'd have a problem. So so we have this enormous institutional and paradigmatic inertia that is um, undermining the kind of learning that could make learning more effective for our children. And two thirds or more of our children are going off the rails into being ashamed of their minds because of their difficulties with this artificial confusion, right? It's a, to me, it's like, well, of course we live in a learning disabled population. Mm -hmm. is, there, is there a happy ending to this story? I don't mean ending, ending, but is there a, is there a, <laughs> did you one day take a turn and, you know, you knocked on the door and it opened? Uh, I, I, I mean that in the sense of, you know, How, how, how is your work? I had several sort of questions floating in my mind. How has Go, your work yeah. been received? That's clear, um, or at least in many, in on many, in many knockings of doors, nobody answered. But um, are there places where you've been able to to get a foot in the door and then have somebody said, "Yes, come in, come on in. We need this." Yeah, more so in the learning theory work. I mean, there's there are people that are picked up and are moving with the, the other parts of, of my work that we haven't really talked about yet um, and that that my talks are about and stuff like that. Yes. On the on the reading side, I've given up on conventional education. Yeah. I'm now uh, I'm working with a group of uh what's called a W3C group, which is a group of folks that are developing the next standards for the evolution of the World Wide Web. I'm in the process of developing a case that I want to get to Apple and Microsoft and Amazon and Google and to the World Wide Web Consortium and others that says, by transforming the way words work online, we can transform learning on the whole planet. And so I'm building a case for doing that and uh, the technological exhibits for that. And th those things are largely done. The technology parts are working and people are using them. Uh, but yeah, it's a long slog. I mean, th this goes back to the core of the work, right? People's ideas about what learning is, which tend to be that learning is an, I mean, in fact, if you look it up on Google, or you look it up in a dictionary, or you look it up in most encyclopedias, the definition of learning will come across as if it's some kind of an ancillary utility for the acquisition of knowledge, skills, and experience. Right. Right. That's the problem. Right. By thinking by thinking of learning this way, all the other dimensions of our learning are invisible to us. Right. Right. Or they're attributed to other causes. And they're, therefore, they misorient right. our action. Right. That has nothing to do with what we're really trying to solve here. Right. Yeah. So my main work is changing that. Like, how do we do that? And so in talks and writings and other things I'm working on, it's like, um, how do we change our central uh, definition, our operational definition of learning so that it becomes, instead of this ancillary mental utility, the central dynamic of how human beings become who they become in every way. There's no, there's no part of uh, human agency that isn't determined by learning. There's lots of things that happen that are outside of the scope of our agency, but inside the scope of our agency, there's nothing that happens that isn't affected by, if not totally destined by learning. Mm -hmm. From yes. eating habits and body inhabiting to emotional regulation to you name it, right? The linguistic, all the academic stuff, which is just the surface of it. Um, yeah, exactly, exactly. And so until such time as we expand that definition, we're not going to get any changes in any fundamental way to what it is that's causing human beings to become so learning disabled in our population.
data is pretty clear, right? I mean, it's like, there's a lot of kids being quote left behind, right? I mean, it's like- Most. But, but even worse than that, being left behind damaged, you know, wounded yeah. in a deeply wounded emotionally. And we know that. And, you know, keep putting, banging our head into this wall. And it's like, well, wait, why is this okay? Why is this not like really important? I, I, I hear that, and, and I, but I choose to think that um, parents in particular okay. and many educators really do love their children. Absolutely. And, and, and therefore it's, it's a misdirected care. Right. 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 So they, they, they don't realize. That's a better way to put it. Thank you. Yeah. No, yeah. I, I, I really think that, and there is, there's the hope and opportunity. Yes. Right. Because if, if parents, I mean, one of the ways I used to describe that is, because I remember this was a kid, I'd go to my house and I'd be standing out on the porch of the front yard because I didn't want to bleed on the house. I would cut my knee or something and I'm bleeding all over the place. Hey, mom, come out here, you know? And mom comes out and they take a, takes a look at you and says, oh yeah, well, we've got to take you for stitches. No, we don't, you know? There's this kind of intuitive sense of how to take care of our various physical ailments and tra tra traumas and what have you. Total obliviousness to the learning side of that, yeah. right? And therein lies the difficulty, the challenge and the opportunity. Right. So, so rather than thinking that, cause we tend to, uh, parents tend to think that they've got to uh, learn some, you know, Spock, Dr. Spockian, you know, nth generation knowledge bank of how to's to be a parent rather than to just orient themselves towards learning into meeting the learning. Yes. And when you see those stories, and there are those stories of parents who, whatever it was, had a hunch, had a, just couldn't, couldn't watch their kids suffer more and, and pushed and pushed and pushed. You know, the, the results are frequently miraculous, both in terms of insight and their own child, but also, also insight and program. And, you know, I'm thinking of, uh, so when I was at New Roads, this woman walked in, um, her, her daughter was leaving middle school someplace. And um, it, was a, it was a middle school that had grown up from elementary years. So it was, as many of those schools are, um, it was a middle school that had a very elementary school flavor, which is really saturated in love and care and embrace. And you know, for the most part, they, they, they cherish the kids. And so this girl who, um, who was uh, on the spectrum in a significant way, um, uh, autistic, mm, she might've had a severe autism, I mean, Asperger's. Um, and here she came to interview at a high school and it was clear in, you know, 30 seconds, the social aspect of this was so, challenging and this woman bless her heart said said you know it's just and i i was pretty honest with her i said i don't know if this is going to work she said you know it's just it's just so backwards it's so backwards it's like i don't care if she gets through calculus or algebra or it's like it's not the curriculum that matters it's the social piece it's the her learning how to be with other human beings that and um she said it just we, i wish we could i wish there was a place where it was just backwards and upside down where the focus was on the focus was on that rather than and we talked a little more and i said well there's got to be programs like there's got to be a place she said i have looked everywhere it just doesn't exist and i said well why don't we start one so we did we started this program is at the school where these kids who were these were highly functional kids on the spectrum who they could do the curriculum but you know they could do calculus but don't ask them to go to 7-eleven and get changed because the social interaction was beyond them 
So we started a program that was essentially upside down that way. And, and instances of that where parents just, they saw an, what their kids really needed in a way that, that educators, theoretically, educators didn't and, and, and made it happen, so. That's a that's a wonderful story. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 The I've met. I, the program still goes on. It's happening. It's still going on. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I've. Uh, I, I was involved with. I've never had uh, a direct experience working with kids on the spectrum, myself. Um, yeah. So I don't. I don't have anything to contribute there other than my sense that your approach uh, of, of kind of how do you develop a learning environment, the intention of which is to bring out that kind of uh, emotional presence and participation, right? How do you actually create the conditions in which well, that will be extended? How do you, I mean, like any other kind of learning, you're always looking at how to uh, vivify the differentiation Yes. Right? Yes. So and that's you know, really cool. Interesting too, even the stuff that 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 was that is frequently still said about kids on the spectrum, you know, that that they don't have an interest in that's sort of, it's completely the opposite. It's like they want they want that social interaction. They want the they want the love, they want the care, they want I mean like it's so backwards and it's so obvious when you're working with those kids and you know I don't pretend to be an expert in any way about that but 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 in you know this little corner is just like wait folks have no idea who these kids are and they're pretty fabulous yeah. and yeah they're different yeah yeah they really are so yeah my my um that brings me to the uh conversation space of learning disabilities or what's called often learning disabilities. Yeah. And that's another one of the areas where paradigm inertia is so rampant inside of the system in that, for example, I had a long conversation with the executive director of the National Center for Learning Disabilities. And um, <clears throat> I really wanted to draw out the fact that there's a, a significant part of the population who has what I would call acquired learning disabilities, meaning that th their, th their learning has been disabled by their learning. Yes. Not, in other words, it's not innately, structurally, maturationally ordained by their bio neurological enfoldment, yeah. right? They, they learned in ways that skewed yeah. their learning their, either- The problem is they went to school. <laughs> Ah, or, 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 as they went to school. <laughs> or they had a traumatic uh, environmental thing going go for them at home, or their home environment was so weak in mm. exercising the prerequisites for success in school that they slammed into the wall in school that other kids just went right through, right. not because of any innate uh, lack of capacity, but because their capacities weren't developed prior to that intersect point with school in their early life learning life you know trajectory so there's so many things that can cause this but my point was whether you talk about dyslexia what percentage of dyslexia is actually genetically neurobiologically ordained and what part has to do with um you know maladaptive learning early on that's that's creating a trajectory that's inappropriate for taking off in reading and that creates what would seem to be on to all observers dyslexia right? right it's we don't we don't have the instrumentation to really tease that stuff out really well but what i would say is, is that for every kid who has a innate neurobiologically ordained learning disability we got 10 kids who have got just about as uh learning disabled so to speak uh, that's a got to always put that in quotes Right. that weren't disabled because of the way they were born or their genes, but were disabled because of their learning, because of the what they couldn't help but learn in or couldn't help but not learn in their learning environments. Mm -hmm. And we don't care about them because we've created a legal line 
to yes. limit the financial liability of support for kids around that line where we can say, well, they were born that way, therefore we care about them. If they learn to be that way, sorry, we, yeah. we, we can't help them. They're just underachievers. Yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, I don't know if this is shifting gears or I want to, I want to, I want to get to the, I want to get to the stuff that you're doing now. And, uh, and especially, especially I want to, I want you to talk about Olson. And, yeah. then, and then, and then we can talk about what you want to talk. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Fair enough. So um, you remember my, my point early on about uh, being able to vary the appearance of letters so as to yeah. cue the mind as to which of a letter's possible sounds it's actually making in any particular word you're looking at. Yeah. Well, I originally did that uh, static. In other words, I actually made fonts that could do that. So they ended up with a printed piece of paper with all kinds of strange looking font variations, which research showed didn't matter to perception. That's another conversation, but, 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 but I, I wasn't making it uh, dynamic and active at the time. I was just making it statically more readable the, by changing the, the variation right. on the page. Um, <clears throat> um, about five years ago, six years ago now, uh, I, 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 for the past 15 years or so, I've been working on electronic versions of that. In other words, electronic display versions of that. But about five years ago, I started to, to come up with a, a, a different variation of that, which was, which was that rather than having the whole page appear that way with these variations, which caused the people that could read uh, some discomforts, right? right? Sure. Um, that it could make it so that anybody could touch any word on any online document and right at that moment that they touched it, immediately get a box that opens up and that guides them through how to work out how those letters make the sounds that make that word have the sound that it has, right? So, so that you could get a, get a tutorial on a per word level um, using these kind of cues, but now instead of being static, they're kind of in an animated form so that they can guide you through word recognition. Now, um, this has uh, two dimensions to it. it, but all the way back to the beginning we talked about, about having, uh, you know, all these different reasons why somebody might have difficulty learning from something they're reading, right? So that we can use the word as a portal so rather than thinking of a word as a as an object or just having a link to a discrete resource, that a word is a portal, and inside that portal, once clicked, instantly upon being clicked, it has all the resources packed into it to to coach anybody, regardless of their language background, their primary language, their reading skill, their vocabulary into how to recognize that word, how to be able to pronounce and recognize it so that the sound of it and the print of it, so to speak, lock together, co-implicate as we talked about mm -hmm. earlier. Mm -hmm. But also while they're there, there's an, an adjacent button inside the little box that if they touch that, it will open up a relevant reference library related to that word. So anything somebody might need in order to understand its definition how it translates into any one of the world's languages, uh, an encyclopedia-like elaboration, uh, synonyms for it, uh, the roots of the word, in case that was helpful, so that, and ultimately that can expand to be anything that anybody needs. Point being that rather than having to, and, and, and this is the big thing that there's a, Olson has two parts to it. One is the learning to read and the other is the reading to learn, right? So, with the learning to read, it's it's actually um, what's the most controversial part of it, which is to say rather than having to abstractly train brains to have the reflexive response to confusion and have the skills and the abstract knowledge of how words work and letters and sounds work to be able to work through that confusion to word recognition in the solitary confines of their mind, right? right? Which is the way it's been for Correct. thousands of years, right? Yeah. Forever. That touching the word would provide everything that somebody could need to learn that word right there, right now, right live, which is the way kids learn everything else. If you remember our conversations well, about the skateboard, for example, right? Yeah, right. So they could skateboard through learning the word yeah. rather than having to have it all crammed into their head, which is where the breakdown 
happens and has been happening for decades. Right. So one thing is to solve for the reading problem that way. And the other thing is to solve for the reading to learn problem by saying, well, I recognize the word, but damn if I know what it means. What the hell is that? <laughs> right. what, yeah, what does it mean here? So, so again, right there, without having to um, guess and jump uh, and hope, hopefully, you know, contextually backfill or any of the other, you know, uh, questionable strategies that kids evolve or you know adapt to. Um, that the, the point being in both cases, and this goes all the way also back to what we talked about early on. Right. The most important thing we can do is exercise their awareness that, hey, something ain't right. Something's not working here. Right. What is it I need? Oh, yeah. Let me go get that. That dynamic of being a participant rather than, you know, a, a, a manipulated object. Yes. Right. Uh, that th th that participation, that kind of becoming ever more discriminating of and differentiating of and trusting of and able to um, disambiguate their own needs and act on those needs. That's the center of their power to learn. You bet. Right. You so bet. how do we create the environment to do that? Well, Olson is that at both the uh, learning to read level and at the reading to learn level. And doesn't go with all the other dimensions that I'd ultimately like to do, but it's a start. Yeah. Yes, indeed. And, 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 and has that, has that been, have you had any success sort of embedding that into even one classroom? I mean, like, like somebody must want to jump on this and say, wait, this is, this is really interesting. This is really, no. Yeah. Yeah. Yes and yes and no. Um, I, we once had a situation with a local school district, Louisville School District. There's 100,000 kids here, 55,000 kids underwater every day, right? And that's a that's a conservative. Uh, yeah, that's you being generous. <laughs> that's yeah. that's cooked books, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, <clears throat> so we went in there, and we had a researcher from Bellarmine University as part of our uh, third party objective researcher watching what we're doing. At the time, we didn't have the Olson touch it and it supports you. We had a variation of the printed on paper or on screens. But um, we, did a, we did a couple of trials with uh, third graders and fifth graders and sixth graders. And the trial results were great. The guys, you know, yeah, this is the, the guy was really a big advocate. Unfortunately, Bellarmine University had a contract with uh, JCPS, right? That was a very lucrative contract about how to train teachers to teach kids to read. Wow. And, and yeah, yeah. And our, and our uh, success was a contaminating factor. Oh, wow. Yeah, that's a shame. Yeah, that's a, that's yeah. a criminal. Yeah, well, yeah. But that said, um, there are other websites. Um, there are, uh, there's a school right now that's spinning up in uh, Taiwan uh, that's using our stuff for ESL. Um, oh, there's this, the story preservation thing that's using it for older kids. Um, but I, I'm not pushing, first of all, I don't have the financial bandwidth to market it. And I've never been a marketer in the sense that I'm trying to persuade or, um, yeah. you know, to play the game that way. Mm -hmm. I'm more interested in uh, uh, kind of challenging the dialogue. And, uh, you know, so uh, like I said, uh, the, uh, the technology Olson is available as, as a, as a, five line script that can be built into any website. So if you had a website and you knew what you were doing or you had a webmaster, in 10 minutes, they could put some script into your website and every word on your website would work this way, boom. If you have a, a Chrome browser or an Edge browser, you can uh, download a little thing, an extension to your web browser. And once it's on the web browser, you can go to any page on the web, any one of billions of pages click a button and every word on that page will work this way right now. That's phenomenal. Yeah. 
Yeah. But, but the reading research people that were my fans during the days of Children of the Code before I was advocating for any kind of solutions, right? I was just pro I was just I was just poking the poking the bear then, you know. Um, that, you know, I, I I wish you could interview some of them and get their take on it. But my sense is that their um, reputations and incomes are deeply committed to various paradigms about teaching reading that what I'm talking about completely upends. Right. Right. There, everything about phonics and whole language and Orton Gillingham and structured word inquiry and all these things are based on the assumption that the that the point that the learner encounters an unfamiliar word, they are alone, as you pointed out in earlier on, and therefore they must be trained prior to that event to have the quick mental reflexes and knowledge and abstract skills, which is bizarre when you think about it, in order to resolve that confusion before their whole house of cards of comprehension cracks crashes on them. Right. And I'm saying that's all antiquated, archaic 16th century thinking, and that we can make every word in the online universe, which is pretty stunning, uh, elastic and able to help anybody learn to read it. And that once we do, it's not that we wouldn't still have on, on a, a, a training wheels component to get people up to being able to use that. Yeah. But the amount of abstract instruction that would be required if every word could respond whenever anybody needed it to yes. with anything they needed to learn it is entirely different. But that that threatens the government policies and the billions of dollars that are made on reading instructional programs and the guruship and the all the rest of it involved in this. What are you doing now that it's exciting for you? For me, yeah, other um, than like you know, learning to ski or something like that, <laughs> <laughs> learning to skateboard. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, this is my life. What I what we've been talking about. It's not like I have. Uh, if there's some compartment that's separate from it, uh, you know, uh, the focus of my work is really the Olson piece, and then the other thing is this. Uh, the core distinctions about transforming learning, right? That we talked about before, and. I, I that's what I that's what my life's about is thinking through that playing with that exploring that dialogues with Gary with you with others that I talk with right it's like until such time as we change this frame we have about learning we're not going to be able to see how learning affects all these other things and our energies are going to be misdirected and you know whether you talk about you know uh the geopolitical stuff, or you talk about the uh, climate stuff, or in every case, the the gap between where we are and some more sane way of being together on this planet, the, the pathway between them, the shortest pathway between them is learning. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's not so much that we need to teach people things, it's we got to stop screwing up how they learn in general, and they'll learn these things. They'll learn them, right. Yeah. I mean, does, do you have a sense that, like, if you could get to the right door, if you could knock on the right door, like there's a person out there, not, obviously, you're not the marketer, but and I'm not suggesting marketing, but, but, but it, it strikes me that there's, you know, there are people who are in positions to, uh, you know, for lack of a better term, that they can move things because they have power in yeah, that way. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. Well, I, the reason I'm doing things the way that I'm doing is, is that I really think that both governments and the big tech companies would be huge beneficiaries of a lift, uh, a kind of a planetary lift in population learning. Right. Right. That's and um, and and what I'm describing is a very small and inexpensive tweak. I mean, with far, I mean, for example, do you remember um, not that long ago where you had paper maps in your glove box? 
Yeah. And that you had to get him out to know where you were going yeah. and to navigate to strange yeah. places. The great step you, forward was the Thomas guide, right? I mean, it's like, oh, yeah, we're oh, yeah. in one yeah, place. Yeah. Wow, isn't that great? Yeah. And now I have to do yeah. it find the next map. Well, like, whatever. Yeah, exactly. 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 Now, now, um, do we lament the loss of those things today? <laughs> Not a bit. Okay. So now we, we all have maps. Now, when was the last time you bought a map? No, you don't buy them. You, you I, have I, a... I did. I bought an atlas several years ago because I had a moment of nostalgia. Gee, right? Okay, that was it. Right, but you have a map today that is off scale, more powerful, more intelligent, more helpful to anything that you might want to do. In right? so many different and you, ways, and, and you don't even pay for it. Right. Exactly. Right. Completely free. Yes. So, or do, or do you do you have trouble sleeping at night over the publishers who lost revenue for map sales? <laughs> no, I think Rand McNally's doing just fine. <laughs> okay, all right. So, so the, the same map model transfers over to what I'm describing. Yeah, you bet. Right, it's in everybody's just like it was in everybody's interest to put these maps in the phones. It's in everybody's interest for the web to work this way for every word on every electronic, there's a difference between a physically printed word, it's dead, it's inert, it's static, it is what it is. Right. Right. But in a word on a display that's being projected by a digital smarts of some kind, right. that word can be a portal to anything we want. Yeah. And it's a very, it's trivially simple to make it do what I've described, trivial. Which, which is remarkable, actually. Yeah. That, I, is, that, is that true for the, is that true for the more elaborated uh, uh, descriptions of whether it's in every different language and 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 what it means or the various meanings of that word? Is is that is that trivial to do as well? That aspect well, if you got up into try, into trying to get into PhD level uh, differentiated definitions and explanations, maybe not. But at the level that the mass of humanity would benefit from, yeah, yeah, that that the that every different country has its own language bank already, its own yes. uh, translator systems, its own dictionaries and encyclopedias, and pooling oh, them together and cross cross indexes relatively trivial. I think yeah. that's actually one of those things that people. You know, pe people who are, who are in that world, as you are, or have watched, have sort of been inside that world as it emerged, and people who, even kids who come to that world afterwards, th there's a reminder, like we have to remember, oh, it doesn't, it's not finding it, it's, it's creating it based on, based on a lot of invisible requests so it really is a living thing and it could live in a different way if you requested a different thing and it's, it's there so yeah so that's it really got that super i mean that's exciting i mean for somebody that's an exciting possibility it's just yeah. amazing I think so too and, and so i hope to i hope to kind of create a spark plug event around that Yep. And I'm building toward that. In the meantime, uh, it, that's one main thrust of my work. The other thrust of my work is the talks that I do. Like I'm doing a talk two, two nights from now to an international father's gathering. And I did one a couple of weeks ago to a regional early child development conference, right? And they vary in attendance and listening. And, you know, I'm always happy to get, you know, 2% uh, of the audience to actually track with me. I'm not trying to sell anything or persuade anybody or manipulate anything. And that's both my disadvantage. And that's, you know, that's the way that is. But you know, it, like back to the conversation about uh, learning and, and what it interferes with learning. One of the things that I ask people um, to think about is, have you ever met a toddler that gave up on learning to walk because it was a pain in the ass to fall? Oh, that, exactly. That's the skateboarders. Exactly. Yeah. That. The toddlers it, right. do it all the time. They're like, right. Yeah. My sense is, is that human beings are born organismically, profoundly, fundamentally learning oriented. Yes. Right. In every way. Yes. Until they learn, they can't trust that anymore. Right. Yeah, until they, learn, until they learn that learning happens in school, the important learning happens in school, 
and then they bump into all of those issues. Yeah, and more granularly, in alignment with what you said, but a step more granularly, it's that they their their trust is in themselves. It's yes. their, their their own compassing is their center of their trust in that process, right? Right. When 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 the the there's not an acquired or learned belief that they're going to be able to walk. Right. It's an abiding innate, couldn't be otherwise faith and confidence in them, in their own agency. Right. And that's what's being destroyed. Yes, indeed. In the name of educating them. Right. And until we stop that, we're going to be in one variation of madness or another. Right. And we we can stop that if we recognize that ultimately, whether we're concerned with their happiness or their health, or their academic success, or their success in relationships, or their, whatever it is, right? How they learn to extend their agency and calibrate their agency and learn to trust and refine and nuance their agency is the key to their success. It, and that conversely, when kids learn they can't trust that anymore, they've got no choice but to become believers, mm -hmm. right? That the world is a really threatening oh, complexly yeah. confusing no. place and if you don't trust yourself to your own agency to learn into it you got no choice no. but to believe in things to keep it at bay you bet whether okay. it's trump or it's religion or whatever it is, whatever it is. beliefs uh, our need for belief are the inverse pole of our faith in our own agency yeah yes indeed i completely agree with that and and yeah. and I would imagine well, no. It's but, hard. To, it's hard to it's hard to see. It's hard to imagine people not seeing that. And I guess we're from different worlds. But so everybody everybody's from a different world, and so people's people's puzzles are different. But you can see it in the you know you know you 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 can Google your you can YouTube. You know, the, the people who are born without limbs or without whatever they are without. And it's miraculous as they go to the grocery store and they, you know, they pick up the grapefruit with their fruit, with their foot and slate, whatever it is, whatever it is, it's so clear that that people find, for the most part, find a path forward and and learn to do all those things, they're not, they are quote disabled, but they're not disabled. And to not be able to see that is a puzzle, right? To be, it's that, it's right. And, it's a puzzle that, and they, that people, more people can't see that. And especially if you, especially if you're presenting them with a tool that could look <laughs> this could be really, this could be really helpful in a really fundamental way. I, I, you must know the, the data. I don't, but I remember reading just the enormous numbers of illiteracy. Right. Oh yeah, yeah. It's just eighty-four percent of the African American fourth grade children in this country are underwater in reading, and right. still eighty percent by the twelfth grade. How do they? Feel, how can they feel good about themselves as learners? No. 64% of the white kids in, in, in between it goes, right? So yeah. most kids, their experience of school, school is a place to go to, to learn that you can't trust learning. You can't, right. Yes. Well, you can't trust your ability to learn, yeah. to learn those things. And some, some people somehow manage to get through that with a sense well, of confidence about something else. And yeah, yes, yes. But on the other hand, the the shame transfers right so so <clears throat> we haven't spoken about that a lot the shame piece yeah this 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 is really critical to i think the kind of widespread the biggest learning disability in our population i call mind shame right just like there's body yeah. shame and there's all these various shames you get ashamed of your mind you're going to avoid things that are mentally challenging, right? In order to avoid that shame, just like you'd avoid strutting around in a bathing suit if you're ashamed of your body or whatever it is, right? So um, <clears throat> I think the majority of the kids that are chronic strugglers, which is the majority of kids, 
what they're learning, what, what they're experiencing is either they have to either not care. So they come up with, like you said, I'm not good enough, which is a, a, a tactical overlay that short circuits the shame because there's a, there's a way around the shame by just accepting I'm not good, right? So it shuts that down. Or um, I'll never be good enough at this or whatever. Or if they continue to care, then they're going to continue to shame. And I think with respect to the art, this is why the artificial confusions are so important, whether it's writing or math or reading. Again, these are artificial constructs requiring artificial um, learning that doesn't self-reference in the way that natural organic learning does, right? And the, the confusion associated with those kind of learning challenges, when that kind of precipitates change, shame, then there can be a linkage between confusion in general and shame in general, and a shame aversion to confusion is profoundly learning disabling because mm -hmm. confusion is involved in, in all le learning. Right. Yes. right? So I, that's why I think mind shame is kind of the center of that action, right? And um, yeah, that's what scares me the most. Like I told you with my daughter and with the kids that I see is that I, I, I think that kids are being shamed out of their minds on mass in the sense that they, yeah, they can still function in this, that, or the other the things that they believe in, or that they develop a kind of script like response to rather than an agency learning response to, right. But um, it endangers their whole life trajectories. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a sad, it's a sad thing. That's a sad thing. <clears throat> well, so does, yeah. so tell me after all this, are you are you a hopeful person? <laughs> yeah, I am. I mean, I it's never been a question. I mean, I, I think that what we're talking about is inevitable. And the question is how many people have to suffer, have to suffer before bit. before I get for until we get there. Yeah. And that, um, yeah, just just so many generations. You said something earlier about the way that uh, kids pick up on what their parents are doing, you know, like how their parents are. And um, for most of human uh, history, if not evolution, you could argue that that was the smart thing, right? That that kids were really uh, parent replacements that they were they were growing up to replace the adults in a, yes. in a pretty limited tracks of functionality right. in the way societies worked right? Right. right and we still have that kind of mentality going on to a significant extent even though that's long past totally. these kids are these kids are going to grow up in a in a world that is I, mean, I use a video of a uh, taken from an old movie where this guy is just blown away, excited as he's talking to his girlfriend, a, a city away on a telephone. You know, wow, isn't this amazing that we can talk like this? Can, you can hear my voice, you know, and that seems so quaint and so crazy and so, you know, like <laughs> to us today, right? right. And that juxtapose that with the, the uh, six or seven year old or even teens that are put in front of a rotary phone and they don't know what the hell to do with no the rotary idea phone. What to do with it, I know. <laughs> right. And as crazy as all that seems to us in a, a couple of generations, if not, if not in the, just one generation, those people are going to look back at what we think meta reality is and virtual reality and think that it's like that guy in the telephone. Absolutely. Without a doubt. <clears throat> it's doubt. moving it's moving so fast and accelerating that the, yeah like accelerating moving so fast and accelerating meantime we're educating as if we're educating them for 20 years ago oh it's unbelievable what yeah that, one of my one of my taglines that's kind of the key on one of my websites is uh, nothing's more important to our children's futures than how well they can learn when they get there yes exactly Right. And if you de if you deconstruct that, there's nothing more important to how well they can learn as they get there than their faith and confidence in learning. Mm -hmm. We we've got to stop thinking that what we think they should learn or how we think they should learn is more important than how well they can learn, yeah. meaning how well they participate 
and their faith and confidence in learning. It's like we need to be adapting and regulating as if our point is to pull their faith and confidence through this ladder up into proficiencies, not for ignorant of that, just taking them over these steps of proficiencies. Exactly. Yeah, right. right. And, and so the that, next protocol, giving them yeah, the next protocol. We're we're not just a little off. You know, we're 180 degrees out of phase. Completely off, right, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, at least we agree with each other. Yeah, yeah. Well, your background makes it uh, easier to communicate with than most, you know. I mean, yeah. It, yeah. and the fact that you actually really care about kids, obviously, that you've worked with parents that are on the passion edge and you didn't work in a factory, you worked in a school. Right, right. And, it, real it, one. and for some reason despite the challenges I had with conventional school, um, there was something about being in a place that, which I, you know, that's my, I have a faith in, in, I'm not sure it should be in college anymore, but, but I have a faith in environments that at least on the, on the page are, a, you know, learning is encouraged here. You know, maybe not that kind of learning, but like, you know, like there is a value for that to get. So I, I've definitely, definitely had that. And that it ought to make sense. That it ought to yeah. make sense. Because if it doesn't make sense, it's like that's, I mean, that was what it was for me. It was the, it was like, I don't, I don't, why is everybody else, how does everybody else get this and not me? I wasn't stupid when I walked in here. What happened? That's a really important point. One of the, one of the key observations to me early on with my son was watching how um, I don't know if you recall these days, but back in the early '80s, um, there was a period of time when there were more Nintendo boxes than personal computers in the world. Right, like 35 million Nintendo boxes went boom, and it wasn't because the adults were playing them; it was because the little kids were playing them. Yeah. It was almost like the little kid said, finally, something's coherent. Finally, something makes sense. Wow. Something makes sense. Yes. And, and there was something about the way that the early games were designed to challenge, but resource, so that you could learn about resources and then learn to creatively apply the resources to overcome the challenges to stay engaged. Right. Right. And that, that made yeah, these. No, go ahead. I was going to say that, that to me, the brilliance of, and you can watch it in how people learned, how kids learned and how their parents learned to play those games that sort of, thank God for the design, right? You couldn't break this thing. Like, I mean, you could throw it, but you couldn't like, you know, you die, you whatever, you, you know, it's screwed up, whatever. You, they just, and they just eagerly restarted it. And parents, you watch it when, you know, people open their Christmas presents and okay, we're gonna set up the VCR now. Okay, so this the arrow pointing this way, I mean, they're reading the instructions and the kids are just, you know, they're pushing the buttons and whatever, whatever. fearless in that way. It was something about being in that design that they, it was built so you couldn't screw it up. <laughs> well, to your point a few moments ago, they could trust it. Yes. They could trust it. They may not, in other words, it wasn't, it was a question that it wasn't that it was an incoherent, bizarre old mess like like the code of reading. Yes. It was implicitly, this is solvable. I know that it's solvable. I right. know that it's coherent. I just gotta learn my way to it. And that implicit faith in the in its coherence made it possible to stay, to extend their attention into it in a way that so many other incoherent challenges in school yeah. don't. Right. Right. Yeah. Well, have I exhausted you yet? Never. <laughs> but but I understand that we've probably come far enough for this. Well, yeah. is there any is there anything else you want to say or talk about or or or? No, I've I've kind of appreciated the opportunity to just go with the flow, and you oh, know no, I've, I've, I've I, I, there's a lot of stuff we haven't talked about, and you know maybe another occasion, if not necessarily here, just as friends. I mean, I've enjoyed yeah. the dialogue, so we don't have to be in this kind of a setting to do it. Yeah, um, yeah I've, uh, I mean, uh, the 
the juxtaposition of implicate order and affect science and neuroscience and learning science and all of these things into one with a intention to be um, via negativa, mm. right? Reducing the obstacles rather than prescripting the path. Yes, dude, dude. I used to say to, I used to say to parents. I didn't have to say it to kids, but I used to say to parents, it's like, you know, this is a kind of a place where, yeah, it's kind of true. In order to get through school, you do. There's things that have to be on somebody's transcript and all that, and so. But it's kind of like this room, you know. You, we're starting over here, and and you do eventually have to get over there. But there's a lot of ways to get there. There's a lot of ways to get there. This is the kind of a place that, like, you know, we, you know, other places will tell you where to put your feet to get there. This is the kind of a place that says, hey, try stuff. And, uh, you know, if you keep walking around in the same circle, we'll, we'll nudge you once in a while. But, but you know, there's a lot of ways. So, so yeah, yeah, beautiful. You. Yeah, do you, that, that's the spirit of the lenses, right? For in what I was doing yes, was that there's no right, the, the, the right way is the right way that unfolds in interactive dance with the one that's learning their way. Yes, indeed. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And, the, and the hardest, and the hardest thing to do in that was to find the, to, the teachers who could allow, encourage, fan the flames of that thing that kids well sometimes it they had it, it had been learned out of them and now they had to sort of find the embers and is there a way to bring that back so yeah unfortunately you know that's a huge conversation um just a headline view of i i when i was in washington talking with the uh, people that wrote no, no child left behind and some of the other people at the department of ed you know, they described to me the reasons for them doing what they were doing, which was viewed as so draconian, was that study after study of teacher core, including Haberman's work and others, um, led to the conclusion that roughly one third of the teachers care and are competent. About one third of the teachers are um, incompetent, but they care. And another third of the teachers don't care and they're incompetent, right? So they had it broken up like that, right? So two thirds of the teachers are incompetent and two thirds of the teachers don't care, right? <laughs> and and it, it, all this bizarro logic. Bottom line though, is, is that we have trained the first person learning out of teaching. Yes. Right. We have we've wanted them to be robotic extensions of protocols of how yes. to do things rather than first person models of learning. Yes. In action. I remember, I, you know, I, I don't know if it's still happening, but what did they call it? Uh, something court a reading program in Los Angeles. Uh, the, the school district. I know what you're I know what you're talking open, about. Open court. Open open court. Yeah, the open court was uh, actually founded by somebody I had lots of conversations with. Uh, yeah, you know. I, go. I, I remember. I remember when that went into place. It was like every kid in the third grade, you know, had to be on this page of this book on Tuesday. It was like yeah. that, and that was just like, oh my god. That's, a, that, that, that's parallel to the whole direct instruction movement, right? Which is hyperscripting what teachers are doing. I know the first time I, I actually spent six hours with the godfather founder of direct instruction. And, and it was a lot, the bottom line was, is that we agreed on the need to reduce extraneous ambiguity. <laughs> well, that's a start. <laughs> But I would rather create the resources in which the children were learning to creatively apply their way to learn their way through a space yeah. rather than micro scripting how they got through it, right? You bet. You bet. But in both cases, you got to reduce the extraneous ambiguity. Yes. Well, yeah. yeah. All right. Well, it's been wonderful. David Bolton, such a pleasure to both get to know you and to get to hear you and, and, and speak. And uh, I look forward to more 
not necessarily in this environment, but uh, it, right. although possibly in this environment. Yeah, but, uh, yeah. But it, I went, we, we talked, talked about maybe doing something together with Gary where we can yeah. do a deeper dive on the how learning and emotion relate to each yes, other. That you know? would be actually really always good when, to, when he's in a conversation. Yeah, but, yeah. No, but, I'm so grateful for him. Yeah. Yeah. All right. All right. Thank well, you so care. much. I'm going to stop.